Good morning and welcome to the first installment of your Washington Realtors Fair Housing series for Fair Housing Month. Um, glad to see you all. So happy we got such a great turnout. Um, I have the pleasure of introducing the woman who needs no introduction. Um, she, you, you know her as our uh, Washington Realtors attorney and she is um, in your inbox twice a week with the um, with get the facts and the legal hotline um, question of the week and um, she does her best to keep us all updated and in the know and out of trouble so Annie I will give you the floor welcome thank you thanks thanks Sandy so today is a one hour um, really fast look at two issues very important to the Fair Housing Act. So let's get going because I want to make sure that we save as much time as possible for, uh, for questions. So I need, Sandy, can you tell me whether or not you can see my screen? Yes, I'm yes, seeing a head shake. You okay, perfect. Okay, so we are talking today about love letters and advertising, and uh, Liz suggested that I get through all of the materials and then take questions. And so I really am, I have, um, I have a, a several slides, but most of them I'm gonna move pretty quickly through so that I can leave as much time as possible for questions at the end of the hour. So really as a refresher, uh, the, the, there are the whole purpose of the Fair Housing Act is to prohibit sellers and every other person involved in a real estate transaction, whether it be for sale or for lease, from engaging in any discrimination against a buyer or potential buyer, tenant or potential tenant, based on the buyer's or tenant's membership in a protected class. There is a federal statute, there is a state statute, and there are some local ordinances as well. All of the federally protected classes are on your screen. The state protects the same classes plus these additional classes. Uh, there are, whoops, I wanted to tell you that on, on the federal classes, the only one that ever needs really much explanation is familial status. And familial status means that a person under the age of 18 resides in the home. They do not have to be a child or even subject of a guardianship for the adults who live there. It's a, a, any minor person residing within the home. On the Washington state specific slide, the only one that typically needs much explanation is this last one, source of income, because it's not technically a protected class under the Fair Housing Act. This is a protected class, if you will. That's not really an, a, a fully accurate term under the Residential Landlord Tenant Act, which prohibits a landlord from discriminating against the tenant or potential tenant based on the tenant's source of income. If they're receiving public or private assistance, uh, the landlord cannot discriminate against the tenant or potential tenant on that basis. And then several local jurisdictions also impose their own protected classes or created their own protected classes. Typically those include age and political ideology. All right. The next couple of slides are definitions of some of those terms. I'm not planning on going through those individually, but if you have any questions about what any of those terms mean, just know that we have those uh, official definitions there and we can re refer back to them if we need to. So advertising, background, really basic information. Uh, the fair housing logo, and you can picture that in your mind, it's the house with the equal sign in it. The fair housing logo is not required in all of your advertising, but it is recommended in all of your advertising. And if you find yourself as the subject of a fair housing investigation, the fact that you include the fair housing logo in your advertising will be considered as a factor weighing in your favor in the evaluation of the allegations. The fair housing poster, however, is required. It must be in your firm's office location, has to be in any model home, has to be in any branch office, has to be in any property management office. And that is the, the, the poster, poster size, it's not huge poster size, but it's bigger than a, you know, eight and a half by 11. 
Uh, you can, however, order it online. It does change from time to time, and you are supposed to have the most current version of the Fair Housing poster in your office location. <clears throat> All right, here is the kind of the big bold headline from the Federal Fair Housing Act with respect to advertising. This is the, this is the provision that uh, any prosecutor who is prosecuting a violation of the Fair Housing Act for advertising, this is the provision on which they would rest in order to make their case. It is unlawful to make, print, or publish any notice, statement, or advertisement with respect to the sale or rental of a dwelling that in indicates any preference, limitation, or discrimination because of race, color, religion, sex, handicap, familial status, or national origin, or an intention to make any such preference, limitation, or discrimination. <clears throat> Excuse me. And I want you to recognize that this is a very broad category. It is unlawful to make, print, or publish. So when we think of advertising, we typically think of advertising as being something in print. It doesn't have to be. An advertisement could be a big banner that you have at the home show. Um, advertising could be what you say to somebody when you're talking about the services that you provide or describing a home to them or describing a neighborhood to them. So advertising is, is any form of advocacy for you or for a property. Generally, um, it, it um, well, okay, so I'm sorry, the, this, the purpose of this slide is to tell you what you can't do. Purpose of this slide is to tell you, but it is okay, while you can't advertise in such a way as to discourage somebody with disabilities or who falls under the familial status class, you can advertise in such a way as to attract those people, to draw them in to the property. So for example, you can advertise, this home is accessible for people with disabilities. You can advertise, this home is accessible to people who are mobility impaired. You can also say, families are welcome. There is a playground in the neighborhood. Just one second. Sorry, I have, a, I have painters who arrived at my house and two dogs outside and I just wanna make sure that everybody was getting along and they are. Joys of working from home, right? Zooming from home. All right, here is the bright headline, and we're going to spend one slide on this, and then we're going to move into something that's not quite so basic. So here is your basic primer with respect to advertising, uh, to advertising seller's property. Remember that it is absolutely critical that you market the property and not who you perceive should live there. So just a couple of examples, uh, you would want to say, this condo unit features state-of-the-art internet access and other high-tech features. You would never want to say, this condo unit is perfect for mature adults, because goodness knows you don't want a bunch of little wild uh, children messing with your high-tech features, right? Can't say that. You could, you should and could say, the street in front of this home is a busy arterial, the property is not fenced. But you would never want to say, mm, with children, you may prefer a home on a street that's not quite so busy. So you're advertising the property, not who you th should think should live there. And then a few words, this is always, I think, an important thing to say to cover just real quickly. The, the Fair Housing Act and, the, and HUD and the Washington Human Rights Commission have not banned the use of words, the words that are on your screen or like the words, you know, similar words like these. But the better question is, although they're not banned, is there a good reason to use this terminology, recognizing that it could be off-putting to some people? So if there is any chance that by your actions, your words, your advertising, that you could either offend somebody or if this is more motivating to you, if there's any chance that you would draw a fair housing complaint, then don't engage in the conduct. And since it is simple to use words that don't create the likelihood that you're going to become the subject of a fair housing allegation, then avoid those words that make it more likely that you will. I know that some MLSs, Northwest MLS, for example, has 
um, does in fact prohibit use of some of these words in, in your MLS advertising, that's because they are exercising the most extreme caution with respect to that issue. All right, I figure everybody who signs up for a, a fair housing webinar that doesn't give them continuing education credit has probably already attended more than one fair housing class. So we aren't gonna spend a lot of time today on the basics. In fact, we've now spent all the time on what I think are the basics of advertising relative to fair housing that I intend to spend. So I thought to myself, how can I help these folks get more than what they've probably already gotten in a fair housing class? So I had to do a little bit of my own research yesterday to come up with a few PowerPoint slides that I thought were more interesting than just the basics. And so, and I, there's no magic to how I found this information. I researched on the HUD website and the HUD website gave some examples of what I would consider beyond the basics with respect to advertising. For example, did you know that the way you give directions can imply a discriminatory preference. And although I had never thought about the issue, it is super simple to see it when you see some examples in real life. When you think about how you give directions, what are the landmarks? What does the use of a particular landmark connote to the person who hears it? Uh, and would it be just as easy to describe the property on the corner of 6th and Main as opposed to lo you know, located near an exclusive golf club or something like that? So think about the way that you give directions. Did you know that where you advertise can be dis considered discriminatory? Is the medium through which you are advertising most likely to be viewed by members of only a single protected class or a single class, even though there are many more medium available that would give the property a much broader exposure to members of other protected classes. Think about where you place your ads, the, the magazines in which you place your ads, the newspapers. Are you distributing flyers? How are you distributing them? Are you distributing them only to offices in certain locations? Where are you mailing your flyers? And what's the basis for selecting those zip codes for mailing your flyers? Think about how you distribute and where you distribute your advertising. Most of you probably did know that when you use human models, you should show a diversity of races, sexes, familial types, ages, and disabilities. But what came clear to me as I was researching this issue and looking for good examples yesterday is that you have to consistently show a diversity of races, sexes, familial types, ages, and disabilities. And a couple of the examples that stood out for me is when a developer might have more than one subdivision that they're selling, and they use photos of racially mixed models for one subdivision, but not for another. Or an apartment complex, you walk into an apartment complex and in their lobby, they have pictures, you know, people using their facilities, people using the swimming pool, using the tennis courts, playing volleyball on their sand courts. And all of those people are young adults, no kids. What does that tell us about who should live in that apartment complex? So the, the pictures that you use in your advertising can have a discriminatory effect. And then finally, I think this is the last slide on advertising. Um, I think I have a summary slide, but this is the last. I think you're muted, Annie. So Annie will be right back. I think her cord, her connection cord got disabled. So just be patient, sorry about that.
Let's see, I see some questions about getting the slides. You can email me uh, after class and I will send them to you if you want the slides. Sorry about that. I'm not sure why my cell phone dropped me, but it chose to. Okay, uh, let's see if I can get my screen back up. Let me just make it. I'm. Yes, hold on. Yeah. Okay. One second. Trying to find your name. Okay. There you go. There. I'm sorry about that. I, I kind of live out in the middle of nowhere. And so I, I use, um, I have satellite internet. So that's what I, how I'm connected for audio and then I'm connected separately for cell phone. And I often, I, it's not uncommon to lose my, uh, my uh, video, but I've never lost my audio until now. So interesting. Okay. Um, <clears throat> so we are talking about uh, how some of the forms of advertising that you might not really have ever thought of as advertising that can create fair housing problems for you. When you post CCNRs, when you're, the property that you're advertising is subject to CCNRs and you post those CCNRs, if those CCNRs include discriminatory provisions, the classic one is that no children under the age of 16 are permitted which is patently violative of the Fair Housing Act unless you have a senior housing exemption. Most of the CCNRs that I find uh, that people send to me and asking me about the, that question, they're not in an adult housing community. They're just old CCNRs when it seemed like it was an okay thing to say. You, you republish those CCNRs and that constitutes a violation of the Fair Housing Act. So you need to get back to your title company if you find if you find first of all you got to be pulling your preliminary commitment for title if it includes ccnrs you got to read the ccnrs and if you find a provision that you think causes you any question about the fair housing act you need to go back to the title company and ask the title company it, what they think about the provision and if they agree with you that it violates the fair housing act they are going to redact the provision from the CCNRs before they reissue them because they too could be in violation of the Fair Housing Act for republishing something that violates the Fair Housing Act. So um, to elicit their assistance, you will get it, I think. Your recept the receptionist in your firm, be careful how the receptionist in your firm describes property to a caller or how the receptionist in your firm treats people when they walk in the door. But since we're talking about advertising, Focus on uh, how does the receptionist describe the property that that she that he or she might have an opportunity to describe when somebody calls the office and there's not a real estate broker on on floor that she, that the receptionist can send them on to. When your property manager describes tenant applicant criteria, could violate the Fair Housing Act. You have a repair person who is your repair person and they go out uh, on your behalf and they engage in casual conversation with somebody and the words that they use violate the Fair Housing Act, that will create a problem for you. And then finally, think about whatever you might publish or even describe as the rules associated with your provision of real estate brokerage services. For example, pretty easy for most brokers to say, I won't write an offer for a buyer who's not pre-qualified. That's fine. You can say that, and that can be your rule. And if it is your rule, you apply it to every single buyer who comes your way, including Bill Gates. Nobody is above your rules if anybody is subject to your rules. <clears throat> Okay, so summarizing, advertising, when you advertise property, you describe the property, but not the buyer or the seller. And when you're advertising yourself, describe the services you offer, but not the clientele that you service. 
love letters. From the buyer's perspective, why are buyers using love letters? First of all, what is a love letter? A love letter is that fateful piece of paper that sometimes comes with a buyer's offer. I have referred to it as the pick me, pick me letter because buyers are using that letter to try and create some distinction between themselves and every other buyer out there, something, a distinction they cannot create based on price and terms alone. How can I distinguish myself because I don't have any more money to offer for this property. I don't, I can't give the seller any more post-closing rent than I've already given them. Uh, what else could I possibly use in this great season where buyers are doing absolutely crazy things anyway? What else can I do? And so a buyer might write this letter to try and establish commonality with the seller. Look how you and I are alike, seller. Don't you want to sell to me because at our core, I'm just like you. Whatever it might be, whatever the basis might be, the basis is more often than not something that if the seller used that as the reason to select this buyer, it would probably be a violation of the Fair Housing Act. It's probably some membership or lack of membership in a protected class. It also may be to generate an emotional basis for the seller's selection of this particular buyer. Oh, seller, it's so obvious that, you know, you raised your family in this home. I can see pictures of your kids and your grandkids and everybody's happy. And, and just know that we're going to treat the house the same way. We're going to raise our kids here, too. You create this most emotional bond based on a membership in the uh, in, the, in a protected class that cannot be a basis for the seller's selection of the buyer. Ultimately, the real, the real answer to the question of, from the buyer's perspective, why are buyers using them? And unfortunately, the answer is because they work. Many, many times, sellers are persuaded to sell to a buyer because of a buyer's love letter and the personal characteristics of the buyer described by the buyer in that letter. So from the seller's perspective, what are some of the liabilities that come with love letters? And the number one liability is that the letter works, right? Why is the buyer using it? Because it works. What's the biggest potential problem for the seller? That it works. Because if it works, that means that the seller is probably picking this buyer based on some characteristic of the buyer other than price or terms associated with their offer. Uh, price and terms, and also their financial qualification. I, I often say there's only two documents that any seller should ever consider when they are selecting the buyer that they're going to sell to, and that would be the purchase and sale agreement, all the terms included with the purchase and sale agreement. Certainly, buyer is not obligated to pick the buyer with the highest price. There could be other terms that are compelling to the seller, but the first document is the purchase and sale agreement, and the second is the buyer's qualification, and however that is set forth to the seller. So let's say that your seller or that you're representing the seller, what um, are some of the issues that come along with this risk of receiving love letters? You've got to explain the issue to your seller up front, and you have to explain to the seller that you cannot subjectively determine on your own that you are simply going to withhold the love letters. I was telling Liz in preparation for this class that there's been an interesting debate among um, NAR runs a listserv for hotline lawyers around the country. And so hotline lawyers from all over the country, this has been the subject of discussion lately, um, love letters. And many of the hotline lawyers from their state say, we simply prohibit brokers from, from allowing them. Listing brokers, you're just not going to present them. I don't know what the law in those states say that, that would lead to a conclusion that, that, that a seller, that a listing broker could unilaterally choose not to present a written statement from the buyer to the seller, but I'm telling you in Washington state, that's not lawful. Washington state's agency law obligates brokers to timely present all written offers and other written communications to and from the parties. You do not have the subjective unilateral right to determine whether or not a buyer's letter will be presented to the seller. If it's written by the buyer and presented to you, you have an obligation to present it to the seller. Hang on, we'll talk in a minute about what that means. 
finally, uh, in today's market, where you as a listing broker can, if you're not receiving multiple offers, you probably need to check your pricing, right? Because I haven't heard of a corner of this state where well-priced property is not receiving multiple offers quickly after listing goes into effect. So seller expect, or I'm not going to tell you to tell your seller to expect multiple offers because how disappointing would that be if you told them that that they should expect multiple offers and they didn't get them but seller let's prepare for the event that you might get multiple offers and what are we going to do in that event seller if you receive multiple offers the way you're going to pick the buyer is is based on again your review of only two documents the purchase and sale agreement and their and their qualifications and seller when you have selected the buyer to whom you're going to sell, I must document my file, my firm's transaction folder, with the justifiable business reason, that is phraseology that comes out of the Fair Housing Act. I need to document my file with the justifiable business reason that um, supports your selection of the particular buyer that you selected. Why did you select the offer you selected? What terms were important to you, seller? And how did the offer that you selected best satisfy those terms? It would be really lovely if there was consistency represented in your firm's transaction folder of conversations that you had with seller when you first listed the property until the time that they accepted the offer that they accepted. For example, if the seller says to you in an early conversation, Look, I, of course, I want to get as much money as I can, but price is not nearly as important to me as closing. I've got to have this transaction closed by X date because whatever the reason might be. If they say that and then they end up accepting an offer from somebody who looks just like them, that's $10,000 less than an offer from somebody who doesn't look just like them, but it will close in 20 days instead of 60 days. That could be your justifiable business reason for their selection of that particular buyer. Whether there are love letters or not, my suggestion is that you document your file anytime you receive more than a single offer, you document your file with a justifiable business reason. Across the country, we are seeing fair housing complaints based on nothing other than a buyer, a disappointed buyer, claiming that their last name was the basis for seller's discrimination. Seller saw their last name on an offer and chose not to sell to them based on their last name. So whether you have a love letter in the transaction or not, my suggestion is that you document your firm's transaction folder with all of these, all of this information, the answers to all of these questions, explaining the justifiable business reason for your seller's selection of the offer your seller selected. So how do you handle love letters, assuming they come to you? Well, first of all, avoid receiving them if you can. And you can't avoid receiving them no matter what you do, but you can avoid receiving some of them probably. How do you do that? You, you educate your seller up front to the fact that seller doesn't wanna receive love letters. Seller, there might, you know, it feels good to have somebody tell you how much they love your property and how beautiful the yard is and how, you know, whatever. But seller, there is so much risk associated with receiving the love letter uh, and explain the dangers to your seller. And if your seller then instructs you, you should put a remark in the seller's listing printout, the MLS printout advising buyer brokers that seller does not want to receive love letters. If you want to get the sell, if you want to stand out for this seller, then honor the instructions that the seller is giving you buyer broker, don't provide a love letter. But some love letters will necessarily come in anyway. We all know that they will. So if your seller receives a love letter, how are you going to present it? In, you're going to have to decide, this first thing doesn't necessarily have to do with love letters, but, but something that I've been telling brokers lately in, in kind of this really chaotic market that we're in, 
if you've got a whole bunch of offers, well, it doesn't really matter how many. If you've got more than one offer, you may want to consider redacting the buyer's name. You, um, the way that I've heard of brokers doing it is you just photocopy the first page of that of the offer, so you're not you're not messing with the one that the buyer has actually signed. Sometimes it's a lot easier with an, an authentic signed document, but you'll figure out what I'm talking about soon, on your own. But take a copy of that buyer's offer and redact the buyer's name, black it out, heavy heavy, you know, coverage of of the buyer's name, and then put a number one, number two, number three on the offers, and then create an index for yourself of buyer number one is the, is this buyer, number two is this buyer, number three is this buyer. That index doesn't get presented to the seller at the, at the presentation table, at least. The seller can certainly see it later. It wouldn't matter. But at the presentation table, you present the offers as offers number one, number two, number three. And remember that the Department of Licensing has said it's not okay to present a chart of the most relevant terms from every offer. You are required to actually put the offers in front of the buyer. I'm sorry, in front of the seller. So... That's why I would say redact the, the buyer's name, redact their signature. Uh, that eliminates the ability of a buyer to bring a viable fair housing claim that they were discriminated against based on their name alone. And then you present the offers to the seller along with uh, financing letters regarding their, their financial capacity. Again, there's going to be more redacting associated with that, but it depends on how strongly you feel about that issue, whether you're going to go to that effort. And if you've got 100 offers, it's a lot of effort. So you're going to have to figure out how much you want to do that. Um, present all that information to the seller and let the seller select the offer the seller wants to accept based on all of the things that seller is allowed to consider. The purchase and sale agreement, the buyer's financial qualifications. Once the seller has committed to you the offer that the seller wants to accept, then let the seller know that, okay, I also have seven love letters. I remember seller, we talked about love letters. You remember what I described to you that they are. And I, yes, I did say in the MLS printout that you didn't want to receive them, but we've got seven of them, seller. And if you're sitting at the seller's kitchen table, it's pretty easy to have those letters in a manila envelope and, and have the manila envelope sealed. And then ask the seller, do you want to read these or not? If you don't read them, seller, then you can't be accused of a fair housing violation based on the letter, but they are written communications from these potential buyers to you, seller, and I am obligated by the agency law to present them, so here they are. And if the seller says, I don't want to see those, then have the seller write across, maybe write across the seal even of the manila envelope, but certainly on the manila envelope itself, you know, um, Love letters received on X date, um, not opened, you know, seller chose not to open, and then signed, dated by the seller to create evidence that you presented them and it was the seller's choice not to review them. If you are presenting offers remotely, then you're going to go through that same presentation of the purchase and sale agreement, buyer qualifications, let the seller commit to the, to the buyers they want to select. And then tell the seller, okay, seller, I have seven love letters. They're in an email. They're attached to an email that I'm ready to send to you. Do you want me to send that email? And if the seller says, no, I don't even want you to send it to me. I don't want there to be even an allegation that I could have opened those attachments. I don't want you to send it. Then you say, okay, seller, I have to have proof that I presented even just by presenting it. If, if all that presentment means in this case is that I told you about them and you said, I don't want to see them, then seller, I have to be able to prove that. You have to be able to prove that. So I'm going to send you an email describing this conversation that I put you on notice that after you selected, you know, buyer number seven, that I described to you that I have these love letters and that you said you don't want to see them. So because of that, I'm not sending them to you and I must have a response back from you, seller, acknowledging the, re the receipt of my email and agreeing, acknowledging your consent or your instruction to me that you don't want to receive those love letters. 
question that I often receive when we're talking about this issue is, okay, so what if the buyer does send a love letter and let's say seller reads it, but buyer describes something about themselves that doesn't have anything to do with a fair housing protected class. Like I'm a master gardener. Well, there's no fair housing protected class based on being a, a, a master gardener. Or I promise I'll feed your wild birds, the birds that you obviously love and feed around your home. I'm going to keep those bird feeders full even after you're gone. These characteristics don't trigger the Fair Housing Act per se. But let's say that your seller sells to somebody that looks a lot like your seller whose offer was subpar by every standard to, compared to the other offers that they received. And your seller says, well, no, it didn't have anything to do with the fact that they look like me. It was because they love mid-century modern and they told me they wouldn't remodel my house. I love my house just the way it is. I don't want somebody to come in here and start ripping out walls and changing carpets. How are you going to prove that? How is your seller going to prove that? Where's the justifiable business reason that drove that selection? I'm not telling you that you're going to necessarily lose, but if you have to defend a fair housing claim, you've already lost. It's expensive, it's time consuming, and it can be emotionally devastating to have to go in and defend a fair housing claim. If you believe that your seller is about to engage in unlawful discrimination, you, you have to try to dissuade your seller from doing that. My suggestion is that you explain and you bring your managing broker in to help you. You explain that in no, no questionable term, that if the seller unlawfully discriminates and you are their agent, then you will also be in violation of the Fair Housing Act. Even though it's not your actions, your agency for the seller's discrimination will make you liable, you and your firm, for that seller's unlawful discrimination. Seller, I will not answer any question you might ask me about personal characteristics associated with this buyer. All you need to know is their financial qualification and the terms of their, of their offer. That's it, seller. I won't give you any more information. So, seller, if you persist in what you're indicating to me is your intent to violate the Fair Housing Act, then I will terminate this relationship. We will not go forward. And when a Fair Housing Act claim is brought against you, seller, I will testify against you. And I will seek recovery of the compensation that I earned by bringing you a ready, willing, and able buyer that I would have, that I would have taken possession of, funds I would I have already earned, funds I would have recovered, but for your violation of the Fair Housing Act. You document with your, and, and honestly, I don't believe many of you are ever, ever going to have this conversation with a seller. I, what Statistics have shown is that there are very few sellers who intentionally discriminate. There are many sellers who unintentionally discriminate. If you begin to have this conversation with a seller who has unintentionally or walking down a path to unintentionally discriminate, um, by, uh, unlawfully discriminate, you are going to pull them away from that path and set them back on a course that doesn't violate the Fair Housing Act. Very few sellers are ever going to put you in a position where you really truly have to terminate the agency relationship because of their intentional effort to violate the Fair Housing Act. All right, that is the end of what I intended to cover. And we have 20 minutes for questions. So Liz, you tell us how you want us to handle the questions. Uh, well, there's some questions in the chat that we can answer. And then if anybody wants to um, ask a question during class, that's fine. But let's start with chat here. Um, so what is the best way to document the reason why sellers choose an offer in a multiple offer situation? So 
you're just going to document your transaction folder, whatever that means to you. You could, it, there's no, there's no one way to do it. You could send an email back to your seller and, and say, seller, um, you know, just summarizing the offer presentation today, you received eight offers. You chose to sell to the, the buyer who I had identified as buyer number four. You selected that buyer because, and then whatever it was, the price, the closing date, no contingencies. They were going to give you post-closing possession, whatever it is. Um, it, their offer was um, better. It stuck out for you because none of the other offers, you know, were as high in the price, had as fast a closing date, whatever it is. Anyhow, kind of just recount and summarize the presentation, and then ask your seller, and tell your seller in advance that you're going to do this. Ask your seller to respond to that email, to reply, and confirm that that is their memory of how the presentation went, that that is an accurate summary of how the presentation went. You could just go back to your office. If you don't want to do it that way, you could go back to your office and make a journal entry in your file about how the presentation went. Here's all the offers. Here's why the seller accepted this, the offer that they did. This is what was important to them. This is consistent with the very first time they talked to me. So really, it's not important how you do it. It is important that you do it. Next question. Okay. Could the fact that the buyer cared enough to take the time to write a letter at all be a justified business decision? Showing the seller that the buyer actually cared enough about getting the home to write a letter, whether or not it is read or not. So that kind of goes back to our hair splitting um, slide. It, 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 let's let's just be extreme in our example. This, this buyer who cared enough to write and 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 sent us a, a full color glossy photo of themselves, and they look a lot like the seller, and their offer is not by any measure not even close to the best offer that was presented. But the seller just thought, you know, they must really want it because they took the time to write this offer. So that's why I'm going to sell to them. You tell me if you're defending yourself at the Washington State Human Rights Commission or at a HUD hearing. How's that going to go? It's, it's not going to be an easy defense. I can promise you that. And if you succeed, you're going to spend a lot of money on attorney fees along the way. So my answer would be if, 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 it, if, it, if it were my client who came to me in advance and asked me if that was something that they could authenticate as a justifiable business reason, I would tell my seller, no, you do not rest on that as your justifiable business reason. I don't know how I would defend you at the hearing based on that. Okay. Next question. Um, is it discrimination to prefer owner occupied over investors? No, there's not a, there's not a um, protected class based on owner occupied versus investor. Again, though, you could fall in the arena of hair splitting, depending on all of the surrounding facts. Let's say that the investor is going to pay $50,000 more than the owner occupant. They're all cash. They're going to close in 20 days. Your seller's already there. The home is already vacant. Um, and they have a last name that clearly distinguishes them from your seller. And you say, and your seller says, no, owner occupancy is so important to me. I, I'm willing to walk away from $50,000. Again, how does how think about how you defend? How do you put words around that defense at the fair housing hearing? I think it's a challenge. And, and so, if you're if you if if the two buyers let's just say we've only got two buyers, if the two buyers are identical in every single respect, every single respect. And the only distinction is owner occupied versus non owner occupied, then fine, pick owner occupied. But no buyers ever come to you like that. Buyers always come to you with differences. And so if the buyer can make an allegation based on their differences that protect them as a member of a protected class, then I don't know how you and your seller um, justify that selection criteria if 
the differences in terms are stark enough. So again, it's impossible to answer these questions with a yes or no answer without knowing exactly what all of the facts are. So my answer is going to be, in this class setting, is going to be the most conservative answer, which is to say, be very, very careful of a distinction like that. Next question, Liz. Uh, the Northwest MLS deleted a comment on a listing that there was a she shed. If I had said man cave slash she shed, should that have been acceptable? I'm sorry, the question said that the Northwest MLS eliminated the comment for she shed. Mm -hmm. No, the, I, I, I don't represent the Northwest MLS. I don't interpret or enforce their rules, so I'm not going to begin to speak on their behalf. So I, I'm just going to guess. But the but Northwest MLS, my understanding is they they don't allow you to work, use words like family room, uh, bachelor apartment. They don't let you use terminology that could lead to a fair housing allegation. And so whether you call it a she shed slash man cave, you're still using terminology that in and of itself will lead could lead to a potential fair housing act claim so my guess would be they're not going to allow any of that next question if the offer you choose is clearly the highest price do you need to do more yeah document that the price that the price was the most important factor for this seller and this price clearly and this offer had the highest price and that's that was the basis for the seller's acceptance how i mean how long would it take you to document your file with that information? And if that ends up prevailing in a lawsuit, late, prevailing in a, in a Fair Housing Act claim, boy, time well spent. Do it every single time you have multiple offers. Uh, by using a spreadsheet of terms to all offers, that is the easiest way to share terms with a buyer name. If you have all offers there and printed, how is that not a good way to cover yourself and seller from fair housing discrimination? Okay, I'm not exactly sure I understand what you're saying, but I, I think is the question asking is that, Liz, I'm not sure you know this either, but is the, is the question um, assuming that the buyer name has been redacted from the offer? Without a buyer name. Mm -hmm. Without a buyer name, perfect. Yeah, that, that was what my suggestion was. If you if you want to use a spreadsheet, the Department of Licensing didn't say that it's unlawful to, or that you that you're that you're not allowed to use a spreadsheet. You can use a spreadsheet to present the offers so long as the full offer is also there. And so if you have a spreadsheet that identifies buyer number one, number two, number three, number four, and then you have the offers and you and you have redacted the buyer's name and identified the buy, the offers that the, the full and complete offers that are in front of you as offer number one, number two, number three, number four. Um, consistent with the chart, that's the perfect way to do it. If you have a gajillion offers, that is a time-consuming process to redact the buyer's name on all of them. So you're going to have to figure out how you're going to do that because the Department of Licensing has said you have to present every offer, the complete offer. You can redact the buyer's name. I'm not saying you have to have the buyer's name show, but you can't, you can't just send the front page of a bunch of offers. You have to send the entire offer and so if you have to redact the buyer name from all of them and you've got 73 offers, that, that can be a time consuming job. Right. If a landlord does not want to go through the process of applying to receive Section 8 payments from a potential tenant, what is the best way to respond to prevent perceived discrimination? Don't represent that landlord because they are in, they're automatically in violation of the fair, of the Residential Landlord Tenant Act. They don't have the ability to say, I don't want to go through the paperwork. Washington statutory law says, too bad, seller. If the buyer comes to you with Section 8 housing assistance, and, and with that, they're qualified to rent your property, you don't have the choice of saying, I don't want to go through the paperwork. Washington law, if, if your seller insists, that goes back to this slide. If you can't dissuade your landlord, the property owner from unlawfully discriminating based on the Residential Landlord Tenant Act, then don't represent that landlord. Next question. What is the preferred term for a walk-in closet? Large, large closet? I don't know. You guys, you guys are the experts in that. I can tell you what not to do. I can't tell you how to how to use your your magical words to sell property. You guys have to do that part. 
Okay. What if seller instructs listing broker to provide a summary of the 30 offers instead of reviewing every offer individually using a spreadsheet to examine terms without any identifying information? So the agency law language says that a, a broker must timely present all offers and other written, written offers and other written communications. The word timely is not defined. The word present is not defined. And with both of those words, they're not defined by statute. We, we, all, we all understand the common understanding. And so if, the, if a court were to have to um, enforce the agency law provision using those words, the court is going to rely on the common understanding of the, ter of the terminology of those words. And in both cases, those words, timely, and present are going to be dictated by the seller's circumstance. And so if the seller says to you, you know, I'm in Louisiana, you've got 73 offers. I don't want you to send me, I don't want you to um, like put in the mail or anything like that. I'm not gonna open them. If, if the Department of Licensing says you have to attach them and send them down here, fine, so be it. But I don't wanna see 73 offers I want you to give me a chart that includes, and then I would let the seller tell you and work with them to create the chart if necessary, what features are important to you, seller, because what, what's important to you may not be what is necessarily important to the seller. But seller wants to know purchase price, earnest money, what, what, do they, does the, what included items does the buyer want, what are their contingencies, what's the closing date, whatever it is, right? Seller, I'm going to, I'm going to tell you, we're going to, let's review an offer together, or maybe we even do a dry run and we go through a, a, an offer, a pretend offer. You tell me what's important to you, and I'm going to use your description to create the chart. And in this chart, then I will list all 73 offers information, if that's what you want me to do. So work with the seller, and whatever the seller tells you is how they want you to present something you make sure you have documented in your firm's transaction folder that this is the seller's description, the seller's definition of the word present, so that you make, so that you present the offer consistent with the seller's expectation, not your own. That's what's important. But you do need to make sure that you transmit to the seller every single offer. Okay, Liz, next. Uh, how do we advise our buyers? Do we advise that they continue writing these letters or not? Uh, if I'm a seller, I do not want the letter. If, 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 if my property were listed tomorrow, I would instruct my listing broker to include a, a, a remark for buyer brokers that I do not, unequivocally, do not want to receive love letters. And if I received love letters, on, uh, if I had that notation in my listing remarks, and then I received love letters, I would automatically have, in, in my own mind, I would think, okay, that's a buyer who's not, I, I'm not sure I'm going to even get to the closing table with that buyer because the buyer broker either can't uh, uh, follow instructions or the buyer themselves could care less what my expectations are for this transaction. And since we have, you know, 30 days ahead of us of working together, if I have a buyer who right out of the gate isn't honoring my request, simple request, then why am I going to pick that buyer? Now, clearly not every seller is going to feel the same way. My mother-in-law is a good example. When she sold her home several years ago, she loved the love letter that she got from somebody who told her how much they loved her. It was a little beach cottage and they loved the little beach cottage and they're going to keep it, you know, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So who is the seller is going to depend a lot upon whether or not it has an impact, but listing brokers, you know, you need to have that conversation with your sellers up front so they understand the risks of receiving the love letters. And then buyer brokers, you and your buyer are going to have to decide what buyer is going to do. And honestly, buyer broker, you may not have a choice. Your buyer may say, I'm writing this letter no matter what. Um, so sometimes we can't control the outcome of that situation. Liz. Uh, is there a buyer, buyer broker liability for submitting a love letter? No. Never. The, the, um, again, remember that the buyer broker doesn't have a choice. The buyer broker is also subject to the agency law and must timely present all written communications to or from the 
parties in the transaction. So buyer broker doesn't have a choice but to pre- but to deliver the love letter. And a buyer cannot violate the Fair Housing Act. The, uh, a buyer and a tenant are the intended protect uh, the the people who are protected by the Fair Housing Act, and they can't violate the Fair Housing Act. So no, buyer cannot, and buyer broker cannot by delivering it. Okay. Since then, since veteran status is protected, is not accepting VA loans or choosing a different offer solely based off the loan a violation? No. You can't discriminate against the buyer because the buyer is a veteran, but you're not, but a seller is not required to select an offer that is contingent upon buyer obtaining VA financing if it is the seller's conclusion that another offer has a, a higher likelihood of closing, closing more timely, closing with less chaos, whatever it might be in the seller's um, mind. The seller can't discriminate against the buyer based on the buyer's veteran status, but the seller has certainly the ability to to choose that they want a cash offer over a finance offer, conventional offer over an FHA offer, whatever it is, the seller is allowed to make that, 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 uh, that choice. Okay, back to CC and R's. I work in community association management. I have several sets of condo CC and R's that violate fair housing. Realtors request all the governing documents when under contract. Are you saying that as the management company, we are liable for a fair housing violation as well, even if we aren't with the association is not enforcing the discriminatory covenant? So my suggestion would be that you get to that association. If you're the manager, you meet with the board and you explain to the board why these provisions of the CCNRs are, uh, they violate the Fair Housing Act. Because they violate the Fair Housing Act, they are unenforceable. Board, I strongly encourage you to get our, to get your uh, association's legal counsel involved because we need to redact your CCNRs. We can't enforce these provisions anyway, so we might as well black them out before we deliver the CCNRs to another potential buyer or tenant. Because yes, if you republish CCNRs that are discriminatory in effect, then you could be liable uh, for a violation of the Fair Housing Act. Okay, I'm going to do one more question and then we're going to end for today. Um, can you put the physical offers in envelopes or a box like you recommend for the love letters while presenting the spreadsheet? So, so in an effort to keep the names um, concealed? No, I, I don't think so because the Department of Licensing says that you have to present the offers. And if the presentation of the offer is made in such a way that the, that the offer can't be viewed, then I, I don't think that that would get past that requirement for the Department of Licensing. So you need to make the, the offers available to the seller. The seller may say, I don't, I don't wanna see them. I, I see them all here in this stack or I see them all here in this envelope. I don't want to see them until after I've selected one. They could say that, that could be their choice, but you should not conceal the offers from the seller. Um, as, during the presentation, because the Department of Licensing would say that the presentation of the offer requires that the offer itself be presented to the seller. What the seller does with it is up to the seller, but you must present the offer to the seller. And that's that. All right. Well, thank you so much, Annie, for all the helpful information today. And thank you, everybody, for joining. If I didn't get to your question, you can always email um, our legal hotline, Annie, and she um, will try to get back to you with an answer. Thank you so much for your time today, and we hope to see you next week for our service animals series. Take care, everybody.